There we go. Continue our study of the book of Ezra. We're going to pick up chapter, I said chapter 2, verse 5, but it's really chapter 1. Uh, too much turkey. Maybe that's what it was. Too much turkey. It's kind of dull in my senses. <clears throat> but um, it's interesting because we talked last week about the, the proclamation of Cyrus and the the time frames that were involved with all of that. And now in verse 5, then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And he goes down the list of the inventory. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and of silver. Sheshbazar brought the brought all these along when the exiles came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now, verse 5 gives to us a major difference between the first exodus from Egypt and this return. In the exodus, everybody left. The Jews left. They all left together. Uh, the whole nation uh, left the land of Egypt. But in this instance, only those whose heart God had moved. And it says that in verse 5. It says, you know, the, the family heads, priests, Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, you know, joined with this and started to move. And it seems that many Jews had become settled and part of the land in which they inhabited. They had been taken as captives, but they were not abject slaves as they were in Egypt. They had, some of them had businesses, some of them had positions, some of them had moved to various parts of the empire. They had settled and they may still thought of themselves as Jews and worshiped God, but the call to a promised land was no longer a draw for them. And they may have looked at the obstacles and decided that to stay put was in their best interest rather than go home. So now, this is interesting. Why did God move some and not all? You know. Why didn't God move all? Why do you think that? Certainly, many of those who left Egypt we're not believers because we find that in the desert 600 and some thousand of them died. So, but they all left Egypt. Why didn't God move? No, go right ahead. Could be. Yeah, yeah, Pharaoh, he, he was, was he like, was the... Pharaoh's held out. Right. And with Cyrus, he did. Yeah, yeah, uh, the Pharaoh was the living God in Egypt. And so he didn't brook any other type of religion that would interfere with, with himself. And certainly Cyrus wanted to placate all of the religions that were in his empire. So he said to all of the people, he said, 
Go back to your places that you want to, if you want to go, and rebuild your temples or whatever that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The heart. And God moved all those, uh, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go. But you had to have a heart. And that, that brings us really close to, to, the, to the issue that the return, this return, wasn't about, you know, establishing a nation. They had, they had already established a nation, and then it had been conquered. This was about reestablishing the link with pre-exile Israel rather than founding a new nation. So the circumstances around, the heart that was in, the, the, the purpose of going was different. This was about reestablishing the ancient links, the, the heredity, the heritage that was pre-exilic uh, Israel. And those who volunteered to return wanted to see the faith of their community, Judah and Israel, continue that was symbolized by the temple. Cyrus said, go rebuild the temple. Those who didn't decide to go, temple didn't mean that much to them. I'm good where I am. Go through all that trouble, 700 miles, take months to get over there. Dangerous. And then I got to rebuild a whole city. No. Nah. I'm good. I'm good. And it was those whose hearts really wanted to see that reestablishment of the glory of the Lord. And you remember that it was in the temple, the Holy of Holies, that God designated his, his name to be. And in Ezekiel chapters 9 through 12, we read about the glory of God departing from that. And that glory never did return until Jesus came to Jerusalem. The glory of God will not return in entirety until it comes in the millennium. But, you know, they were more socially or secularly linked to the social economic system of the empire. And it's interesting, as you look at the map, if you have a map of the Persian Empire, if you notice in looking at that map, Many of the areas were areas that the gospel was carried to in the New Testament, except Athens and Rome. All of Turkey, you know, the seven churches in Turkey, you think Macedon, you have Thessalonica and all those other churches. All of those areas had been conquered by the Persians. Jews settled in those areas through the years. And that laid a providential foundation for the gospel to be able to be carried to those places and shared with the Jews after the coming of Jesus Christ and the, the, the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. So it's just interesting as you look at this to look at the, the you have an incident and oftentimes I wonder, okay, something happened. All right, well, what is the, what is the longer term things? What is that, the root of what grows out of that? that may be useful. And that goes back to our discussion of providence, that even though there were some who did not go, the synagogue became an, a central part. And the word synagogue simply means a, a meeting, an assembly place for people. The Israeli Knesset could also be called a synagogue now. Same word. And the Jews who were scattered in these various areas became, built synagogues just to be able to worship. And that became a place where the gospel could be shared. First to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So it's just interesting to see that. And another evidence that what was recurring was a reestablishment of the historical worship was that Cyrus brought out all the articles of the temple. Now, the list that is given does not total 5,400. 
if you look at the list, you've got 20-some hundred uh, articles. And I think this is just kind of a general category given to show that in all there were 5,400, but Ezra was not directed to, to list out every one of the pans and pots and spoons and forks and everything that was there. Uh, he just gave a general uh, inventory list of what, what had happened, but in total, there was 5,400 of them. And we are introduced to a person in this passage that has generated some debate, Shesh Bazar, and he was the prince of Judah. Now, just who this person was, commentators are not real sure. And being a prince of Judah may refer to Cyrus's designation of this man to become the leader of the first group back. Some commentators say that this was another name of Zerubbabel that we'll catch up to in chapter 2, verse 2 of Ezra. And is a leader by chapter 3, verse 2. And so they, some say that this is two different names, which was not unusual in that time, but two different names because they were titles. They were, you know, they had some meaning behind them. And maybe this was the same person. Don't know for sure. But if not, the rubber bell disappears by chapter 3 after on into chapter 3 after the Israel has come to Judah. So he disappears from the scene. So it's just, you know, the wonder if this is the same person or not. Now we go into chapter 2, and the writer says, now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah. This is another Nehemiah than the one we're going to study later. He didn't come on the scene until later. He was sent in 445. This was uh, 538. Nehemiah, Shariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Big Baal, Rehum, and Benaiah. And the list of the men of the people of Israel, and you can read that for yourself. <laughs> Because there's a, there's a whole lot of pronouncing going on, and there's a whole lot of names that are given here. And you'll see throughout the chapter the, this, the phrase, the descendants of, uh, as well as specific geographical locations are given in this list. That is, you know, kind of like, oh, well, blah, blah, so-and-so is descended from so-and-so, and he lived, blah, blah, you know, that type of thing. But one commentator notes that the identification of the families and their place of origin was important for the self-identity of the people. They needed to recognize their roots in the pre-exilic Israelite community as a reassurance that they were the continuation of God's redemptive plan. What this group was wanting to do as they returned God established Israel. And they went on for a number of years. Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian, well, I can't write it all this morning. Assyrian captivity broke up what God had provided. And people were scattered throughout these empires. In the return, the people who came back and established a city wanted to be able to say, we are the continuation of what God had started so many years ago. We want to reestablish the temple. We want to reestablish the ancient worship. We want to reestablish our history with what God had established way long ago. They needed to validate that they were true Jews, not some composite of Gentile and Jew, because there was a lot of that in, in that surrounding area. You know, God had promised Abraham that it would be through his seed the Redeemer would come. And it was important to be able to link to Abraham's seed. 
to have a genealogical and a physical link to the heritage of the patriarchs, Moses, and the kingdom of Israel. Now, we've already noted that one, the reason, one reason for this was God had told them to keep the line of Abraham pure, not to become intermingled with the bloodlines of other nations. Why was that? Why did he tell them don't intermingle? Let me challenge your wokeness here. Okay. Don't be mixed. Right? Okay. Why? Was it because Israel slash Jews were a better race? Is that what? Okay. I'm sorry? They had a better faith. And they were God's chosen people. Okay? So why did God's chosen people and they had a better faith? What was the problem? And the reason, you know, I'm looking into this a little bit further because all through the years, this idea of intermingling has created a lot of discussion, a lot of hate, a lot of animosity in society and even in the church. Why did they have to keep the seed pure? Why did they have a better faith as God's people? Okay. That's why. I mean, King says, and right on the wall, good and great, not true, not true. The other faith God is good and great. And we put every faith God in every book that had any power, when called upon, they didn't do anything. It was always the Jewish people that had God to take care of. Lines, demons, fire, everything. Jews had God, the others didn't. Which goes right in line. Keep the seed pure, better faith, and as God's people. Why? Because the Jews had God. The issue, and we'll see this as we get into Dan, into the later, latter parts of Ezekiel, especially chapters 9, 8, 9, and 10. The problem wasn't so much blood. It wasn't about blood. As if our blood is better than your blood. Well, it's why this theory is going to be uneasy yoke today, mm -hmm. believer with a non believer, because you get swayed by the non believers' exactly. beliefs, and then you get pulled into this direction that gets you away from God. Yeah. The racial issue with the Jews was bound in the dedication to the ancestry of Abraham in his faith in God, the law of Moses that codified the faith and to ensure a line for the Messiah to come in the future. The reason that we look at and realize that it wasn't about blood, but it was about faith, is because if we look at the genealogies in the books of Matthew and Luke, we find non-Jews that were in there. As an example, David came from a union of Ruth, who was a Moabite, and Boaz, a relative of Elimelech, Naomi's husband. Ruth chapter 1, verse 4. Boaz was a descendant of Rahab. And you know her reputation. Almost everywhere in Scripture she's referred to, Rahab the harlot. She was a Canaanite. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. So it wasn't just race. 
but religion that was important. And the Lord said this so that he knew you intermingle with other cultures that do not believe in me, they will confuse your relationship with me. They will turn you from me. That's what the Lord told the kings. You know what happened to Solomon? Other than the fact that he was rather stupid, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And as I heard a preacher say one time, he had opportunities most men don't have. I mean, you know. He was probably in the Yeah. <laughs> Good thing he was king. I mean, you know. But they turned his heart from God. You can read that in, in, in Chronicles, Kings and Chronicles. The issue was not blood. The issue was faith. And I think it's just important for us to remember that the care and dedication that the Jews had in their return to make sure that they linked the present with the past, we can see that in verses 59 through 63 of chapter 2. Because if you look at that, and this is a New International Version, the following came up from the towns of Tel Mali, Tel Harsha, Kerub, Adon, and Emmer. But they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. The descendants of Deliah, Tobiah, and Nicoda, and from among them, the priest, the descendants of, go down all that list. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there was a priest ministering with Urim and Thummim. The care that they had to do it right is seen in these verses. There were people who came back to Israel, came back to the city. But they couldn't prove their genealogy. They couldn't prove that they had a heritage that linked with the line of Abraham. And so they were excluded from the priestly duties, being a part until... A priest, a high priest, could be established, set up, that had the Urim and Thummim. At least, they will call, some commentators say that these were called uh, circumcised foreigners until they could be determined whether they were actually Jews or not. Because the Jewish people did not want folks from a mixed land bringing in their mixed culture of heathenism. We'll see this in chapter 4. We'll see it in here and we'll see it again in Nehemiah. That those who proclaim themselves as worshipers of God, just like you, really weren't. And so they were careful to try to make sure, are you a true Jew? If so, then that means you are going to worship the God of the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah DNA, an Old Testament DNA. Yeah, um, and that's interesting because in studying on the lesson yesterday, and I developed these things months ahead, so much of what I have to say I I have put down on paper months ago, but in looking over yesterday, I thought. Urim and Thummim. Okay. That might come up as a question. <laughs> that might come up as a statement. So we find the first commands. Let's take a little sidetrack here on this. We find the first commands regarding the development of the Urim and Thummim in Exodus chapter 28. That whole chapter is dedicated kind of to the, this vestment decoration, not just decoration, but apparel of the high priest. And there in Exodus 28, it was described as a vest worn over the ephod of the high priest. It was approximately 18 inches square. 
and it was connected at the shoulders with chains and with rings around the waist. So it wasn't just like, um, you know, a tie. Yeah, it was, it was supposed to be attached so it wouldn't swing around. It was, to, it was to be attached to the high priest's body. And he wore it when he came into the holy place. He didn't wear it everywhere, but he wore it when he came into the holy place to seek the Lord. And the Urim and Thummim was composed of 12 precious stones with the names of the tribes of Israel engraved in each one. And as such, with their names inscribed, he wore this when he entered the holy place. Uh, the high priest always represented the entire nation. And what he did represented the actions of the whole of the people. In other words, the high priest's job, if you will, was never for himself, but for the people of God. Christ fulfilled this in that he always represents his chosen people before God. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews told us that. So that's, he is the fulfillment of that uh, Urim and Thummim. Now the terms themselves are translated rights. and darks. I'm assuming that Urim is light, Thummim is dark. And there's no clear explanation of how they functioned. The Bible doesn't give that. It just says that the high priest wore them, wore them into the holy place, and it was used to, to divine, if you will, the leading of God. And Commentators note that this was probably a last resort to discover the leading of God when there was no prophetic direct message or written message that they could refer back to. The stones may have re reacted as a result of prayer and deep dedication for the will of God to be understood. Now, here in Ezra chapter 2, we are given an example of a situation in which what was understood of God's direction didn't naturally fit the need. You had people who said, you know, we, we're, we're the children of Israel. We, we belong to this, to this or that tribe. But they couldn't produce the documentation. Now, the Old Testament never gives you a clear way of ascertaining whether it's so or not, except for the Urim and Thummim. That's why they said we had to wait. Um, they couldn't prove their heritage. And we may think that when the high priest was appointed and the stones gathered, that through prayer, understanding of which group went into which tribe would be learned by a stone of that tribe, either showing light or dark. This family saying, we belong to the tribe of, Zet, of Benjamin. High priest in prayer seeking the Lord. It would either shine light. Yes, they are. Or dark. No, they're not. It could have been vice versa. Yes, they are. No, they're not. I, you know, we're not told, but we assume that it would work that way. We're not told in scripture. And it wasn't like... Well, maybe they belong to another group. They were supposed to know which tribe they came from. It wasn't, well, we're Jews, so put us wherever you want to. No, that, that wasn't it. They had to identify. And when they identified with the tribe, and the Lord said, yes, they are, or no, they're not. If they weren't, then no, you were excluded. Until you find some documentation the Lord has said, no, and you ain't coming. You're not going to be a priest. You're not going to serve in the temple. You're not going to be considered a historical ancestor of the Jewish people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it was, it was a way of, of guaranteeing that the Jewish line would stay the Jewish line. 
and in particular, the line through Abraham and Judah. That's, that, that was the line through which the Messiah would, would come. So they had to make sure that if a person said, I'm a Judite. Oh, really? Tell me your ancestor. Who, who was your great, 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 great granddaddy? I, no, I, I can't remember right off the top of my head. Uh, well, how can you prove it? Well, you just have to take my word for it. No. We've got to know for sure. So, you, so Satan doesn't work in a deception in the promises of God. Now, we find this action of divination. Let's use, let's use the term because it's basically what it was. We find it even in the New Testament in the casting of lots. The last mention of it that I can remember is Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 26, where someone was chosen to take Judas's place. Now, they had a list of, of qualifications, and they had two people that were qualified for this. They didn't know what to do. So, with, that, with much prayer and dedication, they prayed about this. And, you know, roll the dice, if you will. And the man was chosen. Now, this leads us to several considerations and probably questions that come up in your mind. There are times and there are situations in which we may not be clear as to just how we should respond. Now, these are specifically related to issues not directly spiritual in nature. The Bible is very clear as related to spiritual things. But we may run into situations that are secular in life and we're just not sure how to proceed in the best spiritual way. And the Bible is very clear to show us what is right and what is wrong in our walk with Christ but it doesn't tell you what job to have. It doesn't tell you how to, you know, which, what size house you're supposed to build, what school you're supposed to go to. It doesn't say who you're supposed to marry, other than you need to marry a Christian, a believer. And there are situations that arise that are like this. That has caused a lot of trouble. Because I have heard this. Well, you need to put a fleece out. And, if, and, you know, be sure when you put that fleece out, if it shows. And I know of some, some good people who have done that. And Christians have used the example of Gideon for this in Judges chapter 6 and 7, where there was a fleece that was put out. And there was, you know, the lap in the water. The Lord told you, you got too many people. Take them all down and tell them to drink out of the river. Those that just sat there and just, just glub down into it, those that lift it up and lap it like this, he said, that's the ones you need to use. And people have said, well, okay, the Bible tells me I can use fleeces. The problem with that, and I don't know that, that, that it's wrong to do that in certain circumstances, but we never use a fleece or a sign or an omen to determine whether we choose to follow a spiritual path for sin. Well, I put a fleece out, and the Lord said I can run around on my wife. No, no, I don't, I don't care how wet it got or how dry it got. The Lord did not tell you to do that because Scripture is very clear on that. Um, the Bible is a guide for those decisions. To ask and seek a leading for some secular aspect of life should be joined with sincere prayer and devotion. And you note in these times when a fleece or a sign or whatever was involved, that there was dedication and there was prayer involved in this. It wasn't like, oh, heads I do, tails I don't. No, no, it was a little deeper than that. No, the Holy Spirit wasn't there to always to guide them. We have, that's the New Testament, Urim and Thummim. It's the Holy Spirit, I believe. Because the Bible is very clear that, you know, in John 15 and chapter 16, that the Holy Spirit lives within us and will guide us for the glory of God. 
we may lean on his leadings for things not specifically right or wrong. An example of this is in Acts uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. At Antioch, the church was praying, and the Holy Spirit said, I want Paul and Barnabas to go on a mission trip. Now, that didn't have anything to do with their spiritual walk with God directly. Now, certainly they were close to the Lord for the Lord to use them. But the church was probably praying, what do we do now? What do we do now? How do we fulfill the Great Commission? How do we go about this? And the Holy Spirit said, okay, these two are the ones I'm first choosing to take care of this. And then in Acts chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, Paul was actually forbidden to preach in certain areas. The Holy Spirit forbade him. So the Holy Spirit was acting as the Urim and Thummim, saying, yes, you can go here to preach. No, no, no. For whatever reason the Lord had. He didn't want Paul to go there. So he said, nope. You can't go there and preach. So this idea, you go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody and all this other stuff. Yes, but be led by the Spirit in it. Because there may be some places and some people the Lord don't want you to waste your time. Or he's got somebody else that will do a better job in there than you and me. So, you know, the Holy Spirit is our grooming and thumbing for these things in life. Now, it's all too easy for us to decide a course of action in our subconscious. And then we look for things to validate our already predetermined decision. You ever done that? Or you know somebody who had that? Well, I'm going to pray about whether the Lord wants me to buy this car or not. Boy, that's a good looking machine. And they've already started looking at the bank account and looking at how they can do it. But I won't pray about it. No, no, don't even bother. You've already made up your mind. Go on. You know. Because whatever you're looking for, you're going to find in whatever you're looking for. If you've already made your mind up, you're going to follow that route. We all have done that in some form. Sometimes to virtual catastrophe, sometimes the Lord has mercy on fools and drunks, I understand. And I have been both, and so he's had mercy on me. In looking for direction for something, we need to be sensitive to the doors that open and or close. Paul asked in some of the epistles for prayer that there would be open doors of ministry for him. Why? Because the doors were closed. And he needed, maybe that was the Holy Spirit telling him in other places than what we have revealed. No, I, 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 I'm, I don't want you to do that right now. So he's praying, help me to understand where the open door is. <clears throat> help me to understand what I'm supposed to do. And when we look at some kind of aspect of a sign, an omen, a fleece, or whatever, we need to use some common sense as well in following a certain path. Just because there's a ladder on a wall doesn't mean you're being led to go jump off the top of a building, you know. That, and as ridiculous as that sounds, there are some people, when they're led by their emotions, will do something foolish like that. Well, if the Lord didn't want me to, he wouldn't have had the ladder there. I just feel like I need to jump. Okay, here's a ladder. He wants me to go jump off. No, he doesn't. You don't tempt the Lord. Jesus was very clear with that. So, Sometimes you got to listen to people. I mean, you know, the Bible talks about good counsel. You know, you need to you need to have some good counsel. Don't don't ignore good counsel. And if after seeing a direction is given that then becomes a path to failure, and sometimes we can misread it. We, do, we need to understand that it wasn't from the Lord, and we need to go back to the Word for direction as to how to repent, recover, and redirect our walk. Lord, I made this decision, and now I'm in it. And I thought this was solid ground, but I'm mired up to my knees now. Lord, how, what do I do now? You're in it. You've already made a decision. 
you know, seek the Lord for the guidance of how to get out of the, the swamp, if you will. Now, I still got a couple minutes. I know, I know the sharks are circling out there, but is looking at a sign, an omen, or a fleece, is this the same as taking a gamble or trusting to chance? Is this the same? Yeah, now. Now. I still say we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. Right. We don't have to flip the coin. Yeah. Because if you're in tune with the Holy Spirit and pray about it, you don't have a peace about which direction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whether you do or not, that's another story. Yeah. Almost every young Christian has a battle with what does the Lord want me to do? I hope he don't want me to be a missionary. Good grief, I don't want to go, you know. And, and a lot of people worry about those things. And they start looking for fleeces and things to guide and direct them. But taking a gamble or trusting chance is not the same as looking for a direction from the Lord. Generally when you're taking a gamble or trust in chance, those things are decided by a decision of self-service. Heads I win, tails you lose, you know. Hey, we're looking to serve ourselves. By prayer and a desire to be useful to God and His will, we seek leading for certain decisions. And we need to be sensitive. Go back to those same things I talked about a moment ago. Now, verse 63 tells us that the civil authority, this wasn't the high priest, but the civil authority, the governor, ordered that those whose ancestry could not be verified were prevented from sharing in the most sacred food until a high priest could be declared and a vestment having the Urim and Thummim. Sometimes we just have to wait. Lord, I need an answer now. No, you don't need an answer now. I will give you the answer when you need an answer. You seek me, you trust me, you follow me, but you wait on me. And waiting on the Lord is sometimes the hardest thing in the world for us to do. Because we feel like it's got to happen now. It's got to happen when the Lord wants it to happen. For it to work out the best for us. So... Interesting aspect about the Urim and Thummim. Um, so that was my little excursus, if you will, little sideline. And we'll pick up and talk about it some more next week if we need to. Thank you.